an entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching to help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM certified wellness coach. You are listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast, and I am talking to you from isolation. This is my last day of COVID isolation. Tomorrow I get to be released back out. I'm very happy. I've been chomping at the bit to get back to work. Uh, and I'm very pleased. I'm very blessed that that I'm okay and that it was a mild case. So let me just jump in and explain a little bit about the story. And then I want to talk about uh, some of the research that's out there about post-COVID interventions regarding exercise because I started thinking about, well, you know, I I, I have COVID-19 and I know people that it's ac- absolutely taken the wind out of. I know some long-term effects that people have had. And, and so I started thinking, well, what's the research that's out there? And maybe I could share that with people on the podcast. But first, let me share a little bit about my story. So I was training one morning last week and I got in, I was fine. I felt okay. It was just you know, I had a small, a little sore throat, and I was a little groggy. I was a little more lethargic than a normal 6 a.m. session normally is. And so I finished up my 6 a.m. session, and I didn't have anybody for a couple hours. So I stepped out. I was going to go grab some coffee. And as I went out to get coffee, they start setting up in New York City, at least, which were where I am. They have testing tents everywhere. So I said, oh, let me stop by a testing tent and get a rapid test and let me get my PCR. So I go and I get my rapid test. And by the time I get my coffee and I'm heading back to the gym, I get an email and it comes back. Your rapid is negative. Oh, nice. So I don't have to cancel with my 10 a.m. session. Let me get back in and I'll get back to work. All right. I, I had a few more sessions. They were they were digital. They were online that day. And so then I said, okay, well, let me, let me, uh, I'll go home, get away from everybody. My sore throat had dissipated by the time I had my coffee. I started feeling a little bit better. And I got in that evening and I'm sitting with my wife and my kids. And I'm on the sofa with my wife and an email pops up and there's my PCR result. And the PCR came back that evening and I was positive. I was COVID 19 positive. And I kind of brushed off concerns because of, Maybe the mildness of this variant, even though it is highly contagious, it seems to be relatively mild. But then, for those of you that follow me on social media, you know, especially based off of one of my last posts, that I have a pre existing condition and that over the last month, that pre existing condition has been out of control and it's led me to lose more than 10 pounds in a month. And I am not a big guy. So when I lose 10 pounds, that is a large percentage of me, my body, my corporeal being. What am I? I'm wasting away. And then I start having all of my what if moments. What if I get really sick? What if I have long-term adverse effects? What if I die? Like that comes to mind too. And then you talk yourself off the ledge with that one. But there are things that you think about because I know people who have friends and loved ones that have died from COVID-19. Sometimes this fear, this fear that's starting to build up because I have it and I am in uh, a weakened state of immunity and I'm one of those pre-existing conditions. So I get really concerned. But then my logical mind kicks in and I calm down and I go back to work. And I start calling and I text all of my clients that I had that week and all the clients that I have over the next five days of isolation that I'm gonna miss and try to push them back and let everybody know, especially the people they had seen that morning. So my my 6 a.m. client, my 10 a.m. client, virtual clients, eh, they didn't need to know about it. So I let everybody know. 
So this is one of those conversations that, oh man, I feel kind of bad about. And then you, when you let people know, uh, at least my clients were like, ah, you okay? You feel good? All right. Yeah, sure. I'll get tested. No problem. It's just, it is what it is, especially here in New York. They walk out they walk to the street, they go to a testing tent, get their nose swabbed, and they know immediately or within the next 12 to 24 hours. So it's quick. But my business partner and I, just that morning, Mark Miller, my business partner at the gyms, at ITS, he was telling me how he got it. And it was it was months earlier, and he had just gotten his wind back. He actually said, you know, it was Wednesday. Like, he knew on Wednesday that week or the week before, whatever it was, that it was the first time he felt like he had gotten his wind back. Now, this dude's super fit, super fit, and he's just now feeling like he's getting over it. And this made me want to explore how physical activity and exercise may have uh, this there's it might be this long-term effect for us to get back to normal and can exercise facilitate the process at all. So we went to the research. And here's the thing. I pulled research only from 2021. I didn't even want to look at 2020 because I figured by the time they did any research on 2020, they didn't have enough data to pull any research on anything. So I thought if you have any information in 2021, that's what should be pulled from. Now, exercise scientists have been poised and ready to go on this topic. And I think it's very important to point out that we have huge advocates and our exercise scientists. And I want to applaud those who do the research when it comes to exercise and uh, pathology, when it comes to exercise, heart disease, exercise and diabetes, exercise and cancer, exercise and pulmonary disorders, and exercise when it comes to COVID-19. So let's look at some of the research. This is by Jimeno uh, Almazan et al. in 2021, Post-COVID-19 Syndrome and the Potential Benefits of Exercise in the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. And what they say, they point out that 10 to 20% of people feel symptoms that last for 12 weeks and more those long-termers, right? So we already know that exercise programs and physical activity, according to them, that physical activity levels are excellent modulators of clinical signs, symptoms, and prognosis for many chronic diseases. Overwhelming evidence exists that exercise produces short, middle, and long-term health benefits that prevent, delay, mitigate, and even reverse a large number of metabolic, pulmonary, cardiovascular, neurocognitive, inflammatory, rheumatic, and musculoskeletal diseases. Nice. We know this. There's a lot of great research on that. What about COVID-19? Well, there are some things that we can look at. One, uh, Salas et al. in the British Journal of Sports Medicine does point out that physical inactivity has been associated with a higher risk of severe COVID-19 outcomes. So for those that are sedentary, and we already know that there are other things that are involved there too with, with confounding factors, things that, um, uh, the comorbidities that exist, but physical activity, inactivity is a big one of those variables that we know are linked to more severe cases of COVID-19. So we also know, this is from Browner et al., in uh, the Mayo Clinic practice uh, journal. And it says that high levels of cardiorespiratory fitness are shown to reduce the likelihood of hospitalization due to COVID-19. We know this, we love this, we've been hearing about it, but here's the research in 2021, prestigious journal that's putting it out there. They also said, despite there being no data about the benefits of exercise in post-COVID-19 syndrome, the latest recommendations emphasize the need for symptom titrated physical activity and tailored exercise in rehabilitation. That's according to the National Institute of Health and Research in 2021. All right. So there was no real data about the benefits of exercise syndrome, like researched by randomized control trials. And that is because we can't. They can do a lot of randomized controlled trials right now. That's not 
um, pharmacological because you can get somebody in injection, but to actually have people randomized, blinded studies where they're going in and doing workout routines, um, those, those have been put on hold in many instances because of COVID-19. All right, let's look at another research. And I think this one is probably my, my, my big one that I want to leave you with because it is, um, it's a position statement. And it's Fogarty at all 2021. And it is called the need, the article, The Need for Exercise Sciences and an Integrated Response to COVID-19, a position statement from the International Healthy Living for Pandemic Event Protection Network. And now this network, let me tell you a little about, about them. They provide a collaborative blueprint. It's focused on leading research and developing clinical guidelines, bringing together professionals with expertise in clinical services and exercise sciences to develop the evidence based needed to improve outcomes for patients infected with COVID-19. The whole purpose of this, uh, this community, this network, is to take exercise scientists doing research, taking that research, providing that data, to physicians and other healthcare practitioners. So they take the information and they put it together. And it's not solely pharmacological, but we now have exercise as interventions and physical and lifestyle interventions, not just pharma, uh, pharmacology interventions to help patients that are infected by COVID-19. And so in this position statement, they highlight the opportunities for integrated practice between professionals from exercise science and clinical domains to, to get this alliance in the treatment of COVID-19 for patients that are infected. Exercise science, the, what they want to do, they would took the following subsections, and there are four of them. And this is what they're going to do to consider the impact on insights and inputs from exercise science could have on these four things. Number one, reducing the severity of COVID-19. Now, we don't need to share that information with people that are already fit, plus the people that are already fit believe that that fitness gives them strength sometimes beyond what can actually give them, and they are a bit cavalier in the face of COVID-19. But it does have a significant beneficial effect on the body's ability to stave off the adverse effects of COVID-19, uh, reduce the severity of COVID-19. But this is really more for people also that didn't say COVID-19 is here. Let me make sure I get into really good shape. It is for people who currently have it. We're trying to get over those long-term effects of COVID-19 and those long-term, right? So those long COVID is what they call it. Those long COVID symptoms, tired, some headaches, um, uh, shortness of breath. As my business partner said, the inability to get his wind back while he was training, that, that exercise has a beneficial effect on helping people move past, get through, at least supportive in the process of reducing the severity of those long-term symptoms and even the illness chronic, uh, acutely. They also want to use this as an opportunity to tackle mental health issues during the pandemic. And we know that there are significant benefits when it comes to fitness, when it comes to exercise, and its beneficial effects on anxiety and depression, and so and, and other mental health concerns. And we see that during the pand pandemic, these cases are rising. And so exercise as part of the process to help uh, tackle the mental health issues that we see during the pandemic. Uh, it's a, there's a strong argument that they make in this article to support for that. Number three, they want to increase the resources available to the healthcare system. And by resources, it's not, here's the, the next best drug. Here is a new vaccine or an mRNA or a traditional vaccine or uh, the, 
the COVID pill or all of these things. This is exercise. This is giving arms to physicians and the healthcare team so that the healthcare system sees the data when it comes to exercise and encourages physical activity in help uh, of overcoming the symptoms and severity of COVID-19. And then the final thing we try to do is figure out how this integration can be achieved. So what does it actually look like? How do we integrate it? How do we have these conversations with the physicians? How do we get the conversations between the physicians to take place with the patients to let them know about the benefits of physical activity? And we're going to pump the brakes on using the word exercise here because people who are told to exercise that don't exercise may be afraid of exercise. But we talk about physical activity, just getting up and moving more, being more active, more standing, less sitting. Uh, more standing, less reclining and lying down, uh, moving, pacing, jittering, uh, the, all of these things. This, any type of little movement is better than all the types of no movement that take place. And then we look at it and we start proper tailored exercise that we could use that, that's promising and effective to help minimize and mitigate the post-COVID-19 symptoms that are going to help people recover faster. And as they say, in order to increase their autonomy, their functionality, and their quality of life. Because we see that exercise does that. Exercise does increase autonomy, functionality, and quality of life. And so I see that, and that bolsters me as somebody who, uh, up in it, it, early on, after getting it, knowing there's some things going on with me that I was like, oh man, what if, what if, and the what ifs started peeling me apart inside. And then I talked myself down. I'm like, oh, that's crazy. That's a crazy, don't, don't talk to yourself like that. That you're, you're getting into a downward spiral. Uh, so start thinking about the logic behind what you're saying. Uh, I, I feel comfortable and confident knowing that Aside from some of those things, I am cardiorespiratorily fit, I'm physically fit, I have a healthy diet, and uh, I've been vaccinated. I feel I felt that great gave me great confidence. Uh, and then say, okay, all right, now, now it's time for me to do what I can, take my breaks, take my rest, relax, isolate, and start looking up how exercise can be beneficial to people, myself included. I hope you found this beneficial. I hope you found it helpful. And if you know of somebody that needs to hear it, send it to them. Share this with them. Thank you so much for listening. Reach out to me if you have any questions or comments. You can reach out to me on Instagram where you can also see the story. It's me getting into the screen. You'll see the, the picture I'm doing squats. Read the story. I talk you through the story about my 10-pound weight loss and my concern that's there. Uh, that's on my Instagram page at dr.rickritchie. You can also email me, rick.ritchie at nasm.org. If you've emailed me before and I didn't get it, then DM me because sometimes I've found that whatever virus protection thing that NASM uses doesn't let all my emails through. So if you've reached out to me and I didn't respond to you, that and I am not ducking you. I am not. So you can DM me instead. Thank you so much for listening. Subscribe to this. Like it. Share it. I appreciate everything. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast. <laughs>